everybody. I am Tony Pellegrino, and I want to thank everybody for joining me. Um, this is a live tech talk that I do every Tuesday and Thursday here on Facebook. So thanks for joining us. We're, uh, we are really on time for once. So um, I hope that doesn't catch too many people off guard. And uh, hopefully you can all hear us good this time. I think we finally have the bugs worked out. So, um, Deb, if you can uh, figure out if everybody can hear us and we're all looking good. Why don't you go over what we're going to talk about today? I certainly will. Today, we are going to talk about uh, where we kind of left off on last week's, which was builds up to 35-inch tires. So... Um, I'm going to field questions. Hopefully all of you or most of you have watched that video that we posted, uh, both on Facebook and YouTube. So if you have any questions, you can get those typed in. Um, we're going to talk about uh, the cost associated with each direction or choice you decide to go. Um, we're going to talk about weight and uh, wheelbase. So... Um, Let's see, as always, I welcome your questions and comments. Please make sure that you include the model year Jeep you have and um, whatever other information you can include that will help me answer your question. Um, today, we've got Alex, Debbie, and Jamie here in the studio helping me out. Um, let's see, if you are enjoying this information, please uh, like, share, um, invite your friends, you know, help us get the word out. We're, we're really trying to um, engage people and get them inspired into going off-roading and building their Jeep. So uh, by all means, um, let's, uh, you know, help us do that. Um, do you want to try and switch mics? We've got about three people that are saying you're scratchy. Might do you want to try switching mics? It might just be my voice. I, and I'm, it might just be your voice. Yeah. But. Try it. Yeah. Turn this down a little bit. Is it? Is that helping? Try the volume bit? first. Yeah, he's okay. messing with the volume. Okay. Um, okay. Most people said it sounds great and looks great. Okay. So. Well, then we'll leave it at that. Okay. Um, let's see. I've got a couple of things that I want to talk about before we get started. What we call our featured product section, and uh, one of them is going to apply to um, what we're talking about today, which is a simple cooler on your power steering. I'm going to pull this out of the box. It's uh, it's very small and this just gets plumbed on the return side. This will pull a ton of heat out of your power steering. So, you know, a lot of you that are, that are focused on that 35 and down, and, and honestly, I run two of these stacked on my Jeep and, um, you know, with 40 inch tires and ram assist. So you put this on with a standard steering box, it's gonna keep the temps down and add a lot of life to your power steering setup. So it comes as a little kit. It's got uh, hoses and clamps and everything you need to, to know about it uh, with instructions in here too. So um, nice little thing that's available on our website and they're not that much. So you're gonna to wanna to check that out. The next thing is, uh, Steering box skid plate. Um, this is especially important for the older TJ LJs. Um, these really protect the front of the box from getting bashed and it comes with hardware. These are 316 steel, super beefy, powder coated, ready to go. Um, we've also got um, some brand new swag stuff. We just got in the brand new uh, Genrite socks. I haven't even like check these out myself, but uh, I know that uh, these have been really popular and uh, wow, they got a nice little label on them and everything. They're, uh, oh, and it says uh, Jen on one foot and right on the other, I think. So uh, pretty cool. We'll have these up on the website and uh, check those out. Good Christmas kind of a thing. And uh, we've also got our own, finally our own neck gaiters uh, with a big GR and then a lot of little GRs on them. Um, so these are going to be pretty cool. In fact, uh, I haven't opened these up either. Let's check it out and see how they are. So there you go. It's uh, the typical 
with a big GR and a lot of little GRs. Uh, typical length, you know, that you can wrap over and uh, pretty nice. I'm going to have to pick one of those up for myself. And uh, the next thing I was going to talk about was uh, Power Tank. So Power Tank offers a whole bunch of different options. This is kind of the, uh, the mid-size. Um, they sell one bigger than this and one smaller than this. These are really nice to uh, refill tires. So when you're first getting into off-roading, you've got to make this choice about, do you get a small air compressor to air your tires back up? Um, Viar makes one uh, that we sell on our website. Um, there's the power tank option. ARB offers a double air compressor. And then we sell another one on our website that's called uh, Rock and Road. And that one, you can air up and down all four tires at the same time. And they sell it as a portable system or one you mount in your Jeep. And um, it is super fast and, and effective. Uh, it's also done off your phone. So um, you, don't, you just hook things up and let it go and it'll air up or down to your preset uh, levels that you want. The benefit to something like a power tank is that you can run power tools. So air actuated power tools, um, it's fairly small. The other nice thing I like about it is when somebody else needs air, they don't have to be close to your vehicle. You just pick it up, hand it to them or carry it down to their vehicle help them and bring it back and put it in yours. Yep. First question on the power tank. Um, hey, Koo Papas, power tank, does the regulatory on that thing, uh, the regulatory, the regulator, regulator. Yeah. Uh, on that thing freeze over because mine's frozen over, how do I keep it from freezing? So a lot of it has to do with the amount of air volume you're using. Uh, so depending on what you have it set at, um, will depend on how quickly it freezes and what the outside temperature is as well. So um, I know over on Power Tank's website, they've got a little tips and tricks section. Go over there, check it out. If you still can't find the answer, um, give those guys a call. They're uh, super friendly and uh, happy to help um, and, and probably shed some insight on that. So um, just, you know, I, I know it, it's, uh, I can't answer your question directly because I don't know all, all the amount of air you're using, but the more you use, the more it converts from CO2 into your tire, depends on how fast and what that temperature change is. Heiko said it's set on 90 PSI. 90. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, obviously your uh, tires don't require 90 PSI, so if you can bump that down, it'll help that cooling effect on there for sure. Uh, Bobby Dillon asked, do you like the monster valves for airing up and down? I, you know, I've, I haven't used those myself, but everybody I know with them, they leak. So um, I, I would stay away from those. And uh, by the way, I use the simple, uh, my Jeep's up in the air right now, or I grab them, the little ones you just screw on the Schrader valves. And um, honestly, by the time I you know, start on one tire, walk around the Jeep and come back. They're, they're almost done. So, um, you know, I, I feel like everybody's getting way too overboard on this stuff. It's, it's simple, fast. I think those are $14.99 on our website. Those, those simple little ones you screw on. So um, we don't have to overcomplicate this or drill new holes in the wheels for sure. So... Yep. Mike uh, Stewart posed a question about axles and 35-inch tires. Um, we've had a couple of people chime in, but okay. I'd like to hear your opinion. Mike Stewart, um, JK 2015 on 35s, Trust and Gusset, uh, the Dana 30, or just go ahead and get a Dana 44. He's looking at going to 37s later down okay. the road. Okay, so if we're done with the air stuff, I will skip on to, because now we're talking about our regular topic so let's let's go to that um and that's great I, I appreciate everybody jumping right into that so um where i want to start with on the regular topic and, and then i'm going to get to this question um here's what i need you guys to focus on what you need to focus on is the amount of ground clearance you have the approach angle and the departure angle these are going to be the most important things for you to really start to get off-road okay so um 
All of the Genrite products help you with that stuff. Um, the, the main thing is, is I'm, I'm trying to steer you guys on what's important, yes or no, okay? Because a lot of the time, everybody starts buying all this crap, roof racks and uh, storage carriers and you know all kinds of stuff that don't matter. And I wanna make sure you guys are putting your money in the right place in order to get you a good off-road experience. Okay, so um, the next thing that we're gonna talk about is re-gearing for tire size. But, but actually, I can stop here and I can answer that question now before, before I move on because I know we're going to get a bunch more questions. So if, if you look at the cost of, uh, man, and I really wish this had internet, uh, maybe, maybe I just need to bring in my laptop. We've got a Curry 44 front end on our website. And um, if you look at the cost of doing all of those upgrades that he mentioned earlier, you know, gusseting it, trussing it, and putting in different shafts and doing all this stuff. Um, and did he say what Jeep it was on? 2015 JK. 2015 JK. Okay. So the, the 30 in a JK isn't great. And uh, honestly, you know, the JK is a much heavier vehicle than its predecessors like the TJ or the LJ. So... Um, I would, I would just upgrade and get into the 44 and I would, you know, Curry and Dynatrack both offer great options on that. Now the benefit is, you know, you're going to get it from them with the gears you want, with the locker you want. And, uh, honestly, then when you do that, it comes with a warranty. You know, you go to some, uh, no name, you know, gear change place and sure they'll give you a warranty, but it's going to be out in the middle of nowhere when it breaks and, um, really, when you've got a bigger company like that standing behind it, they're going to make sure they use, you know, genuine Dana Spicer stuff. It's going to be good name brand stuff, and you're not going to get stuck with a bunch of uh, cheap Chinese stuff in there. So It's a two-door also, by the way. Two-door. Yeah, it's a little bit lighter. Um, but honestly, you know, if you're, if you're inching toward 37s or bigger, um, you know, you definitely spend the money once and uh, get into that 44, because it'll also be a high pinion, by the way. Um, so that'll be really nice and, and uh, that'll be money well spent. And by the way, if you don't screw that up when you decide to go to 40s, um, you, down the road you'd be able to sell that really easy to somebody else and probably for just about all the money. So um, I, I think that would be a good investment for you. What other questions have you got? Stay calm. Stay calm. <laughs> We have a legitimate question from somebody who doesn't know, hasn't seen your previous lives, Neil Overstreet, trying Daniel? to decide between ORI or coilovers. Oh boy. Okay. I know you don't seem to be a fan of ORI, but I'm not sure why. Can you explain, please? Yeah. So the um, let's let's start with you get what you pay for, right? If it if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. So ORIs were originally designed and built for small rock buggies. They're very lightweight. And, and when you're building a small vehicle, you need a very compact uh, package. Okay, they, they call that the package because um, that has a built-in bottom out, built-in top out. Uh, but you have to keep in mind that it's only held in with a half inch bolt on the top and bottom. And everybody I see running those doesn't run them as straps, doesn't run bump stops. They're not doing everything that you should in order to save that shock, okay? So whether it's a coilover or one of those, you know, there are certain things you need to do to assure that your vehicle is gonna stay together. Now, all that said, you're also talking about a much heavier vehicle, which means the pressures are much, much higher that you have to run in an air shock to keep the vehicle at the proper ride height. So that means you're putting a lot more pressure on the seals and um, you're, you're really just asking for trouble. So, um, you know, you're, you're not gonna find any vehicles here on those. I know there are people that run them, um, but you, you couldn't talk me into one of those. So hopefully that answers your question. And I, what, have you got more, Deb? Uh, Matt Nine, okay. what axles would you pick for a 78 CJ7? 
On what size tire? Matthew 9, what size tire? So, um, you know, typically he's probably going to be on uh, 35s, you know, or, or you really start hacking that thing up. You know, the, the fa factory fender wells weren't very big on that. Um, and I know plenty of people that, that build the, the factory axles. Um, that was an AMC 20 in the rear and a 30 in the front. You got to spend some money to, to get those beefed up. But um, if you're looking to change axles, he's got 35s. 35s, yeah. Mm -hmm. If you're looking to change axles altogether, then um, 44s is a great way to go on the 35s, and um, you know that that would be especially if you did aftermarket upgraded axles, you know, like Dynatrack or Curry. Those are high clearance 44s, high pinion on top of that, and uh, that that's going to be a really nice upgrade for going off road. So um, for not a whole lot more money, you can get into um, like some Curry 60s. And I just put some lower cost Curry 60s over on our website that are perfect for the CJ, YJ, TJ, LJ guys um, that uh, are 67 inches wide that allow you to run a deep backspace wheel like a four and a half. And um, those are, are much more affordable, come with the lockers, the heavy duty, everything, the high steer arms, you know, the, the whole nine yards. You can see them over in the drivetrain section on our website. So uh, that or remember, I got three guys sitting over there, call in, talk to somebody, and they can give you the details and the information because we answer the phone here. So um, always important. Deb, what else you got? Uh, Fields, Paul. Uh, hey, Tony, I'm on 37s with the Dana 30 True Track Locker for 88 years. And at 3,100 RPMs, I'm at 80 miles an hour. Is that common? Um, okay. So that's going to go to our next slide. So our next slide, and Alex, I don't know if you're zoomed in here. Um, this is the gear ratio versus tire size. So at 80, he's at what RPM? 3,100. 3,100. And he's on a... 30... 37-inch Dana 30, 80 miles an hour. So, yeah, he's probably in the 488 or 513 uh, range. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's good that he's got those gears. But this is, this is the question everybody always asks. So on a 35-inch tire... A 456 is your is your ideal, and then if you're if you're moving, you know if you think you're going to want it geared a little lower, you can go to the 488. Um, the only problem on the 488, if you're running a Dana 30, is it is 11% weaker. So um, when you get to a 488 on the smaller Dana axles, you've only got one tooth in contact. We talked about that last week. Fields Paul's 488. 488, mm -hmm. yeah. So that sounds right, but. And that means our chart is just right. So, um, yeah, and that's that's great. Um, now, if it's revving too high, you know, you could drop a gear size um, or, you know, um, make an appropriate adjustment there, you know, from uh, tire size. I know a lot of the time tires say 37 on the side and they're really a 36. And if it's worn, it might be a 35 and a half. So you just got to kind of look at what you have and, um, I know Goodyear, uh, Mickey Thompson, there's a few that are true tire size. So what else you got? Uh, Bruce <laughs> Nix, what would you do for axles on a 2017? He doesn't say, but I'm assuming it's a JK. Yeah, probably. It has a 44 inch in the rear and 30 up front. Yeah. So, you know, again, if you're, if you're just trying to go to a 35 inch tire, um, you, can, you can get away with that for a little while. Um, what I would uh, what I would avoid doing is putting a lot of money in that front 30. Um, the rear 44 is fine. That's that's going to hold up. You can put a locker in that. You can regear it. You know you're you're not throwing money away at that. But the front is the one you really got to look at. And uh, <clears throat> you know you can sell that. By the way, if you've got a Dana 30 in the front, there's plenty of people that have crashed them, and you know college kids and stuff that are looking for a bolt-in Dana 30. So you can sell what you have and put that toward getting a 44 and uh, really, 
uh, kind of help yourself step into that. And at least that way you're not, because once you start putting gears and a locker and all that stuff into a 30, you're, you're never going to get that money back. So um, I, I really encourage you to put that toward a 44. Uh, Sam Walker asked what uh, speed this chart is set up for. I, I think this was set up for freeway speed, 65. 65. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, good question. Yeah. What else we got? Um, Derek Barry, would it make sense to upgrade a JKU Sport to front and rear Rubicon stock axles leading up to going as big as 37-inch tires? Or would upgrading the front axle and re-gearing the rear stock, non-Rubicon 44, to match make more sense? So that, that's a great question. And that, that is a little bit harder decision to make. Um, if you happen to find a pair of clean Rubicon 44s, um, that's a great way to go. If, uh, if you can't find them, or if you find a pair and the guy doesn't want to separate out the front, then um, you know, you're kind of faced with, okay, just build your rear and get yourself a, a 44 from one of the, the aftermarket companies that makes one by Courier Dynatrack. And uh, by the way, you know, when you get one of those 44s, it's high pinion, it's beefy. A lot of the time they even have uh, 60 outers on them and stuff. It's, they're much higher quality and higher clearance. Um, so you're really kind of doing yourself a favor if, if you want to stay in that 44 groove. And like I said, even though you buy those, man, you could always sell that thing. There will be somebody knocking at your door to pick that up as soon as you are ready to sell it. So that, you won't waste your money on that. We've got a cage question yep. from Terry Runyon. Can you talk about the crossbar and X bar on the JKU with Genrite cage with kiddos in the back seat? Any concerns about being in an accident on the street and them hitting their head on a 2018 JKU? So, by the way, that bar that's there uh, that, that we call the harness bar, um, that is all the way forward where the rear seats will still fold down. And we, we just took some pictures of this in one of the, the Jeeps. We just installed the cage. So if your occupants have their seat belts on, they will not hit that bar. I mean, it's, it's way up there. Um, the, uh, the, the X bar is kind of what I refer to as uh, like wearing a full face helmet. You know, if you're going to spend the money to put a cage in and you don't put the X in, I, I don't know if that's the wisest decision. You know, it's a, it's a $299 upgrade, but it's, it is where all the strength comes in in the kit. And uh, because it really, you know, most of the time when somebody rolls over, they tip over and that tip will make the cage just kind of do a parallelogram. And uh, when you put the X bar in there, it says solid and, and it won't, uh, you know, do that parallelogram thing. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, I know you see a lot of people out there with just cages with just simple lightweight tubes and stuff. Guys, if those ever roll, if they ever toss it, they're, they're going to be trashed. And, uh, you know, I, I, do you feel comfortable putting your family in there? And, um, you know, those are all the questions you have to ask yourself. So, so just make sure you have good secure seat belts in the back seat and they're wearing them. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, certainly for the question that was asked, you know, yes. you, you keep kids in there with their seat belts on or upgrade like Shane did and put the harnesses in. They're not going anywhere. Yeah. So they're, they're certainly, even a little kid folding over cannot hit their head on that bar. I'm telling you, because the whole seat folds down. So. Uh, Kelly asked if we're doing the swap meet this year or this. Yeah, this year. I don't, I don't think so. I don't think so. Probably next year. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, and you know, if you've got parts to sell, list them over on my classifieds would be my yeah, recommendation. That's a great idea. Yeah. Uh, Roger Rowe asked if this gear ratio chart is for a G, uh, JL automatic. So, well, this is for, uh, this is for any Jeep. You know, this, this is, this is the RPM you're, uh, going to turn that. So this is the way it works. This is the simple gear ratio chart. So, yep. This applies to everything. 
Uh, Stephen Warch, uh, hey Tony, can you run 35s or 37s on a Ford 8.8 .8 rear end? Um, so that, that was a popular upgrade for the folks that couldn't find a 44, especially in like TJs and YJs. Um, the, the nice part was is that it came with disc brakes. So for, for the guys who like on a YJ came with drum brakes, um, that was a cool little upgrade, and they were kind of dime a dozen out in the junkyard. Um, so, yeah, those will work. Um, I know a lot of people that ran them for a bunch of years, and it is, it is as close as of an equivalent you can get to a 44 that's out there. So not, not bad. Not a bad option at all. Uh, Eric Frey, I'm looking at the four inch fenders for my CJ7 and wondered if the YJ inner fenders would work on my CJ. I'm trying to keep the Jeep as low as possible to fit 35s. Yeah, um, on that one, I would call in and talk to um, Andrew or Keith. I know that both of them have had several customers that have used those inner fenders. I don't know what mods it took to do it, but I know that they have used them. So uh, just call in and talk to the guys and see, um, you know, if you're a little bit uh, handy, I'm, I'm sure you could make them work, so. Uh, Mike Stewart asked, how, how many spline count on the Curry 44 high pinion? Those would be 33 spline. Yeah. Yeah. It, what, what happens is on the 44, if you go to 35 spline, the carrier um, right here, I'll bring this over. The carrier, the, there's a bearing that goes on here. And this starts to get too thin. So, you know, this is under extreme load, guys, you know, when the, when the gears are fighting each other. And when this gets too thin, um, that's, that's no good. So you can't go too crazy on how many splines are in there because you're limited by the size of the bearing that's allowed to go in the carrier. This one's made for a 70, and that's still only, you know, maybe 3 16 thick. I mean, it, you know, there's not a lot of meat left in there. So, um, yeah, you just got to keep that in mind when you're trying to stretch it. Uh, John Arias asked, when you align a lifted Jeep, do you go by factory specs or something different? So, um, there, there's a couple of things that, uh, so when you do alignment, you do toe in and toe out and you do caster. So, um, and we talked about this once before, and I'll, I'll use my remote as an example. So when you get your Jeep, it's got six degrees of caster. And uh, when, you, when it's stock, the control arms are straight. What happens is, is people start to lift them, and the control arm starts to come down. Well, as the control arm comes down, your caster goes away. Now, if you tilt this back to get the caster back, what you're doing is you're taking your pinion angle and you're turning it to the ground. So now your drive shaft's doing this, and that's no good. You, you're going to feel that um, every time you're driving. So you can't torque this pinion uh, too long. Now, in the old days, what we do is we cut off this C, we turn it and reweld it. That's called a cut and turn, and um, super popular. Not very many people do it anymore. Um, they should, and. Uh, it, it gets you the caster back. So you keep your pinion angle right where you want it and you can adjust the caster back to, by the way, it's only six degrees stock. So, um, but you can adjust it based on how much lift you have. And uh, that's what we do on our kits. So when we, when you buy one of our kits, when you buy the Curry axles, you're getting, we've already adjusted for all that. So everything's perfect. So you can do it at home. Um, that's a modification that even a, a local welder or yourself can do to cut the C off and, and uh, re-weld it on. So, yep, great question. Uh, Daniel Justice, what gear ratio should I go for on a 2019 JL Rubicon? I have Dana 44s with 410 already on 37s. Yeah, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't touch those um, because the, what, what you would go to would be a 488 would, would get you um, to be, you know, 456 to 488 would be perfect, okay? But that's only 0.7 difference, uh, not, not even quite, you know? So um, that for that, 
you're that's right on the cusp, okay? And the the JL, the reason I'm telling you this is the JL has uh, an eight speed transmission with a really low first gear, and uh, that's how that's compensating for it. So um, for that case, I wouldn't even touch it. I'd, I'd leave it and run it because then it's all factory stuff. And by the way, the 411 that you have in there now um, has um, good tooth contact on the pinion. It's, it's pretty optimized. So. Uh, Pamela Spear, I upgraded to 38 inch Baja Pro XS MTs nice. on my GT 4.88s, dedicated off-road JK. I keep it light with the combination seem solid. Any common fail issues I should watch for? So it was 488s on what kind of axles? Uh, let's see, 38 inch Bajas, 4.88. She didn't say. Didn't say. Didn't so, say. Um, you know, obviously the, the bigger the, the number, right? So Dana 30 has a tiny little pinion. Uh, I, I was, we've, we've done this in previous uh, tech talks, you know, where we showed all the pinion sizes. So the Dana 30 is like, you know, this, and then the 44 gets a little bigger and the 60 gets bigger. Pamela said G2. G2. Okay, so that's that's probably like a, a aftermarket Curry 60. So, um, yeah, if, if you're into a, a 60 ring and pinion, then, um, then that's, you know, on a 488, you got plenty of teeth. So, yeah, you're fine. That, that'll hold up just, just fine. If it's a 44, it's not bad. Um, where I start getting nervous on a 44 is when you go to a 513. And um, if you're on a 30, you really want to be on that 456 max. So Sam said they're a G2 brand. Brand, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they, they use a bunch of different center sections, so I don't I don't know. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that's it. Okay. Caught up. All right. We're doing good. Thanks, everybody. Great questions today. Um, we still got about a half an hour. So um, keep feeding me these questions. I'm going to go back one slide. And I really want to emphasize, <clears throat> if you're thinking about building your Jeep right now, I really want you to pay attention to this, okay? This is uh, the most important. And uh, what happens is, is everybody, you go to an off-road shop and the first thing somehow either you or they talk you into is skid plates. Well, what skid plates do is they hang down even further, okay? So um, you got to find that balance of how much do I put skid plates there versus can I get this thing up? Um, and remember, the tire size dramatically affects the clearance you have below the differential, right? So you want to find that balance of keeping a low center of gravity, right? So keep in mind, this back picture is the Terramoto. And this front picture is a regular Jeep on 37s, and here we're on 40s. So you can see that we're able to get more ground clearance on a bigger tire by changing the, the configuration of what's happening on the bottom. So I just don't want you guys to lose focus on these important aspects of your Jeep. These, these are really important. And I know everybody gets all caught up in lift kit tires and wheels, and um, I just want you guys to take a deep breath and figure out what's important, okay? So now we're gonna go back past the gear ratio chart. I got and, a couple more questions okay, if you sure, wanna take them now. Sure. Ronnie Collins, 2018 JK Willys edition with automatic transmission. Is re-gearing necessary for 35 inch tires? No, he, he should be fine too. Yeah, the automatic, you know, that, that helps to compensate for a lot of it. Um, it'll, if you re-gear, it's going to make the thing seem spunkier like it did when it was stock, you know. Um, so if, if it's really struggling on hills and if you're loading it up to go camping and stuff, then you might want to re-gear. But otherwise, you know, once you go to low range, man, you'll, you'll never know the difference. And uh, it, it should wheel just fine. So, um, and, and again, my guys, if you call in, my guys can talk to you in more detail um about the pros and cons and um, we always repost this program too so you can go back and look at that gear ratio chart as well and kind of figure out where you are on on your vehicle matthew nine coil overs or under for a 78 cj7 
Uh, okay, so that was probably spring over or spring under. Okay. Um, so the the spring over is an immediate five and a half inch lift. So so that's the the difference. Now what happens is, is the springs get very flat when you do that, and um, because you got otherwise you'll end up with way more lift than that. You you want the thing to be flexy, right? But the problem is, is it loses its road manners. And on a CJ, the frame is very narrow. So that means you've got a whole bunch, and I'm, I mean, where, where I'm holding my hands is about it, of axle sticking out from the frame. So um, does it flex good? Yes. You're, you're going to get 1,000 on the RTI ramp. It'll, it'll be great. Is it drivable? Eh. If it's a trail rig only, it'll be fine. But if you've got to go down the street much, then, then you're really going to have a handful so um, just find that balance. And again, um, call in and talk to my guys. Keith is my CJ guy. You can talk to him till the cows come home uh, right here on the sales desk. So call on in and he'll, he'll have lots to say about CJs. So what else you got? Jacob Sunderland, spring over YJ, best steering options. Ah. High steer bracket keeps braking on 35s. Um, okay, so... Uh, super popular on uh, that setup. I mean, we've, because we offer a, a chromoly high steer kit for that. And what we do is we sell a high steer TerraFlex knuckle. Um, I know a long time ago, more mountain off-road engineering made a bracket that would adapt to your factory knuckle um, to allow you to get that. And with the spring over, you know, you're, everything's clearly out of the way. So that helps a lot. And um, I used to run this for a long time um, on 35s and 37s on my YJ until I converted it over to a three link. So um, definitely possible. And there's plenty of parts out there and available. If, uh, if you call in, uh, talk to my guys, they can probably steer you in the right direction. Um, if not, shoot me an email and I'll be happy to uh, send you some links on where to go. What else you got? Uh, sorry, I got to find my spot <laughs> Deb's going uh, down over there. Jeremy Duper should I upgrade my Rubicon 241 transfer case to an Atlas transfer case ah that's a great question okay so the the only reason to upgrade from a Rubicon transfer case to an Atlas the only reason is to be able to get front or rear drive this allows you to engage or disengage one or the other or both um, so that you can do a, a dig, you know, if you want to sharply go around a corner or if you're on something that's on a slope, you can do the rear wheels only and, and get it to slide over one way or the other. There's a lot of little tricks that you can do um, by having the ability to go. So your transfer case right now gives you the ability to go high or low range in two or four wheel drive. Okay, when you go to an Atlas, you get all that. Plus, you can do it with the front or rear axle. So it, it gives you much more capability. And uh, really, you know, if, if you're a serious off-roader, um, you won't waste your money by going to an Atlas. It's an incredibly heavy-duty unit, rebuildable. Um, we've used them for years and years and years, racing and everything, and uh, never let us down. So... Um, it, it wouldn't be money wasted, and you can sell your Rubicon case for pretty good money. So, because um, that'll bolt right into somebody else's Jeep. So, great question. Yep. I think it's relating to your previous slide, okay. the uh, yellow ratio? JK. Oh, uh, Mike Stewart. One. Yeah. How are you tucking the bottom in there? And Eric Brady, not <clears throat> so easy to do on the JKs. It's not as easy to do on the JK. So um, we sell a gas tank that moves your factory tank from the middle. So the, the main culprit in the middle of your Jeep is the gas tank hanging down. And not only is the gas tank hanging down, but then there's a skid plate on top of that. We make a, a tank that you get rid of that one, you move the fuel pump module over and you put the tank in the back. Then that frees up the entire middle section. Now we do a couple different stages of skid plates. So if you go to JK on our website and go to skid plates, you'll see we've got some different options, even with the stock cross members. But getting that gas tank out of the middle is the biggest thing you can do. You'll gain three inches of ground clearance. What do you got? So Mike Stewart, 
the same gentleman uh, asked, how are you tucking the transfer case and the skids underneath? So the, the transfer case is actually already up. So we sell another skid plate that when you get rid of the gas tank, because remember, all your factory skids are connected together, including the gas tank one. So you're going to toss all that, and you're going to put our gas tank in the back, and then we sell a brand new skid that goes in the middle to cover the transfer case. And it's, it's much smaller, and it's aluminum, and it's thick, it's nice. It's a great upgrade, and it'll give you a ton of room and clearance back. So, um, yeah. And then, you know, obviously the next step would be to get our elite cross members and do some of that stuff. And then you can have the truly flat belly. You know, right now your factory, this is your factory exhaust also hanging down. Um, you can go to the muffler shop and get that tucked up. You know, there's, you, you look, you, you've got to be diligent. It's going to take some work to get all that stuff that's hanging down, push back up. Um, the good news is, is it can be done and it's the best way to gain ground clearance because otherwise you've got to go to a much bigger tire, which means much bigger drivetrain in order to gain the same clearance. So that's, that's why this slide is here because I'm trying to get you to think correctly. Don't just think bigger tire, more clearance and more lift, right? Because all of that means driveline's got to be, get beefier. Yeah. Uh, Mitch Moore has a really good question. Can your flat belly skid with your cross members and gas tank relocate be used with any, uh, without any other parts from the Elite kit? Um, I, I know that we have customers doing it in stages. That's why we separated uh, the Elite kit parts out. Um, you, you would be wise and you know, a lot of these questions are a much more detailed um, response depending on where you're trying to go with your Jeep. Um, so uh, what, what I'll do is I'll, I'll give you an example. So an example is um, you come to me with that kind of a scenario and you go, Tony, I'm never going over 37s and I want to keep the factory 44s and keep the coil springs. You know, I'm going to do, you know, all this stuff. Well, then the next thing I know, you're trying to go to 40s and like, it, it, look, everybody's plan changes, but in order for us to advise you and, and make sure that we're stepping you in the right direction, we, we have to have an understanding between us. And, and we're happy, like, we know this inside and out. We're happy to say, here's going to be the drawback. Like, you go down this road, don't call me and say you want to do this because it's too late, right? So my guys across the street on the phone are ready to have this conversation all day long, and they do. Uh, but it is totally possible for minimum buck to get what you're looking for, for sure. Yep. Uh, Bill Witten, 93YJ, 6.0, 4 liter, 60 trans, 241OR, TC, one ton axles running 4.88 gears, worth the expense to re gear? Question mark. Do you want me to read it again? Yeah. Okay, lots of details. Yeah. 93 YJ, yep. 6.0, 4 liter, 60 trans, 241 OR, TC, one ton axles, yep. running 4.88 gears, worth the expense to re gear. And, and what's his tire? Or where he wants to go to a bigger tire? I, I didn't see a tire size. Okay, T so for a 37, the 488, perfect. Um, if you want to go to a 40, you need to move. I, I encourage people to go to a 538. Um, 513, you know, that next step is, is not enough, um, which is in this range. But, uh, you know, 538 is really where you want to be um, if you're going to go to a 40. So just keep that in mind. Um, and and it'll, it'll, even though you're running a much heavier duty drivetrain and bigger tires and pulling all that down the road, the 538 will keep the thing where you can adequately do the speed limit and uh, the thing won't be, you know, uh, blowing its guts out trying to go down the road. A uh, good question from Chris Silviera. Rubicon okay. Express belly pan center section versus tracer belly pan center, center section. What is the biggest difference or advantage to the tracer? So the, the, there's, there's a whole bunch of advantages to the tracer. Um, one is, is that the whole thing's designed to use genuine Johnny joints. You're, you're not tied to some fluky, what I call one trip joint that blows out after one trip. 
Um, second is there's no bolts on the bottom of that skid plate on the tracer where it's riddled with bolts on the bottom of a Rubicon Express. Not only do they get bashed, they rust, you never get them out, you end up drilling it. It's a joke. Our skid plate bolts on the side, the whole thing drops down for full serviceability. And by the way, our skid plate doesn't hold the drive line up like a Rubicon Express does either. So every time you hit the bottom of that Rubicon Express, you're transferring that shock load into the entire drive line. So um, we don't do any of that stuff. That's 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 like old school, trying to do it on the cheap. Like uh, honestly, in this day and age, they shouldn't even be in business. It's ridiculous. So um, yeah, no comparison whatsoever. Our, ours is much better materials, thicker, better quality, everything about it. On top of the fact that we pulled I know they look similar, but all of our geometry is right off Jordan's 4,500 car that was unbelievable, handled like it was on rails. So, not to mention that our pan and everything associated with it, all the mounts, drop the entire drive line down to give you a better lower center of gravity. So, um, yeah, almost not comparable, other than having a slight resemblance. Yeah, not even there. What else you got? Uh, Eric Brady made a comment, and I, I'm assuming he's talking about our gas tank. He said the gas tank is not carb legal, though. So um, the, the gas tanks are carb compliant. They reuse everything associated with your EVAP system. So, um, you know, that's that's 100% up to you. If, uh, if you want to be a dork and go over to the smog guy and point out that you've bought an aftermarket tank, then they're, they're probably not going to pass you. If you shut up and don't say anything, the thing will fly right through because it's invisible to the vehicle and the OBD2 system. There you go. Josh Thompson, what's the best way to lengthen a front drive shaft for off-road use only? Quality of tubing needed to okay sleeve it. Um, yeah, you, well, first off, you definitely want to use DOM tubing. Um, and you could sleeve it, um, you know, obviously that, you know, we're talking about off-road use only. I, I would not run that on the street at all because it's probably not going to run as true and round. Um, what I would normally do is just retube the whole drive shaft. So I just take it to my drive shaft shop and for 60 bucks, they'll cut that out, reuse the ends and put a new tube in there and I'm good to go. So um, think about that as an option too from your local drive shaft guy. Uh, Jack Kildigian, uh, I need the skid plate for 2008 JK Rubicon with the gas tank already relocated. Yeah, so that's on our website, and uh, it's a, you know, an aluminum skid plate. You'll see it on there. It's five sixteenths thick, and uh, goes right in. So check that out uh, or call in. Josh Thompson asked, "What's the best way to sleeve a front drive shaft for off-road use only?" quality of tubing needed question mark yeah that was the use dom and um yeah you're gonna have to cut a piece that goes inside then cut up another piece that would match the od of what's there and then weld it all together but it, it is not going to run true so don't try and go fast uh, you're you know it'll shake the whole thing apart so mike stewart how many gallons is the fuel tank relocate uh, 20 and 25 are your two options. So you could pick up five extra gallons if you want. And they can call in to get more information. Definitely call in and get more information. Yep. Uh, Bobby Belomi, any experience with TerraFlex full float kit for rear 44 and lockout hubs for front UD44? Running 37s with 4.88 gears on JKU. Just wondering if there are any major fail points I should be concerned with or put these axles on wife's JK with 35s? Uh, <laughs> um, you know, the, those are all um, great upgrades to talk about. Um, I don't know that it's worth the expense to go to a full float kit in the rear on that. Um, it depends. You know, if, if you think you're wheeling that hard, it's probably time to go to a 60 and put those, you know, on your, your wife's JK. Um, you know, all of these are super cool things that in little bites, you know, you can do and afford. Um, but you just really need to ask yourself, okay, you know, how far am I trying to get? If, if I'm really trying to get to 
40s eventually, then you're you're just um, you know kind of buying time. But it, you know you could be putting that money towards something bigger and better that would ultimately get you to where you want to go. And maybe that maybe you're just looking for somebody to give that to you straight and tell you that way. But hopefully that helps. Randy Kelly, so I just want to make sure before I commit on 2016 JKU Rubicon, I plan doing your elite kit, but I can only stay with my 44s for now. So besides some RCV axle shafts, what else should be done to the 44 to handle the abuse they will get? Okay, great question. And you can actually go on our gallery and there's a, dra a gray JK that we built on 37s with our elite kit. Um, you can do it with the factory Rubicon 44s. The, the, the difference is, is you're limited to a 37 inch tire. Okay, so just hear me loud and clear. Do not try and go to a 40. Don't stick wheel spacers or anything. Offset wheels, you're just going to jack the whole thing up. Um, that you need to follow that build very carefully. If you can't find it on our website in the gallery, um, you know, uh, probably Andrew would be my first guy and uh, maybe Jeff second um, to talk about that build in particular, uh, but totally doable. And uh, yeah, you could, you could uh, run for a long time and have a, have a great time and uh, not have to throw that extra money at the big axles. What do you got? Um, Greg Havlick, he has a 1997, not sure what, um, what would that, be 97? Yeah. Okay, TJ. Uh, four cylinder, looking to put a 4.3 V6 V6 cool. LV3. Yep. Is that an advantage over a 5.3 liter? Um, not necessarily. You know, the um, I, I happen to love that uh, six cylinder Vortec engine. Um, you know, but the five threes, I mean, both of those engines should be readily available and inexpensive but there's nothing that replaces the torque of a V8. So if, if you're looking for that, um, you know, you're, you're not going to go wrong. And I'll give you an example. Um, we had a Suburban, our, our family had a Suburban with a 5.3 liter and a 4L60 transmission in it. And um, I could get like 25 miles of the gallon in that thing because the motor's not working hard, right? It's, it's a heavy vehicle like our Jeeps are, but, but it's not working hard. So, um, don't don't undersize the motor thinking you're you're going to be getting ahead and and don't get me wrong i i like that vortec v6 um i had one in an astro van that thing ran like a top and um it's a it's a great platform and if that's what you have access to put it in and don't think twice but um if, if you haven't done anything and you're like do i do that or do this get the 5.3 um, and if you want more information on that Call in Jeff Perkins. He's put one in right now, and he can give you top to bottom everything you need to do. So um, lots of good advice here at Genrite, for sure. Uh, Richard Jedlowski, 04 TJ with J.K. Curry, high pinion, 44, 5.38, ARB, 37s by 17-inch tires. What backspace and offset wheel should I use? Um, well, did he give me the width? So the typically, what, on what, what Jeep? I might be able to guess. 04 TJ. 04 TJ. So they probably built those at 63 and a half or 64 inches wide. Um, so you're going to be stuck with a, like a three and a half, three and three quarter backspace wheel on that. Um, that's the, you, you've got to go like 65, 67. Uh, today we would sell you a 67 inch wide axle for that same vehicle. So... Um, but that's fine. You know, you can make it work. Yeah. Uh, three and a half inch backspace wheel and you'll be set. Alfonso Ortiz, 2016 JK Dana 3044, 3.73 gears auto automatic. Would 35 tires put too much stress on the transmission? No, no, well, that, that, but that's the limit. You know, you're, you're right there. Um, if you want to, it, you know, and again, if you're going to load it with camping gear and your family and, uh, you know, bicycles on the back and stuff, um, you're probably going to find the 373s, the, the thing just struggles and you're going to have to keep gearing down to get on the freeway. Um, but it'll, that thing will run around town and, and take you on some trails. And like I said before, when you go to low range, 
it'll be perfectly fine. Um, and again, you know, look at look at the gear chart. You know, 373 to 411, which a, which a Rubicon has, is only a few tenths over. Um, so it's it's not much, guys. And uh, 35s will be fine on that thing. Keep in mind, a real uh, often uh, what says 35 on the side is really 34 inches. So um, rarely is it a 35 inch tire. Mitch Moore, what is the travel of the King 2.5 coilovers in your JKU Elite kit? Yeah, so I run 12s in the front and 14s in the rear. And guys, if uh, if you're very curious about my Jeep, my, my JK with the, the Elite kit, again, go to the gallery section and I have every single part listed in detail with hyperlinks to every page of every product. So including that information right there, it tells you, you know, what size shock I have and it takes you right to that. And uh, you can see every single part right down to the tiny little blinker lights that I have um, on my Jeep. So if you're, if you're hungry for detailed information, go over to our gallery. We got a lot of stuff hyperlinked over there and uh, with, with a ton of detail. What else you got? Because I haven't even made it through my slides yet. Uh, go ahead. Okay, so we're going to talk about lockers for a second, and I want to explain the difference between the lockers. So True Track, these have been around forever. In fact, one of our viewers earlier said that he's been running that for 30 years. They've been around a long time. Um, that is what's called a limited slip uh, locker, and um, those are those are great, and uh, they're good for um, on and off road traction situations. Um, similar to that, the Pause Track. Um, what what some of these do when we're, when we're talking about um, those kinds of lockers is sometimes what they do is they rely on a little bit of wheel speed from the other wheel to add some friction to clutches inside that make them start to grab and pull the other tire. Some, um, like the True Track, allow a certain number of rotations and then they lock the other tire. So. Um, that that's that that's what you're looking at on these devices. When you go to a Detroit, that takes a quarter turn of the drive shaft. So remember, your ring gear is you know four or five uh, to one, right? Um, so a quarter turn of the drive shaft. That's not much, and it's fully locked. Both wheels going forward or reverse. Detroits again have been around forever. They're super reliable, um, very inexpensive. They're probably half the price of a selectable locker and um, again, very reliable. So good way to go. The downside to the Detroit is if you live in an icy climate, when that locks up like that, it's going to be hard to drive uh, because that's, that's the same as like a spool. As soon as it locks, you know, it's driving both tires. So um, that's why so many people choose the selectable lockers like the Auburn that I had on, out here earlier which is an uh, electric locker, um, or an ARB, which is an air locker. So that's why those get to be so popular, is because people want the ability to be able to select them locked or not. So um, important choice to what you're doing. Now, this I, I did not include what's called a lunchbox locker. Lunchbox locker, uh, typically there would be um, some little spider gears. That actually, there are still some inside this one um, and what they do is they, they take those spider gears and they lock them together and uh, the problem is is that um, it puts all the force on the tiniest little parts inside your your differential carrier and um, they'll work for a while they, they I've, I've seen people um, get through the Rubicon uh, with that kind of stuff but it is not a long-term solution it is a very short term you just have to know you're throwing your money away uh, but you can literally put that thing in without pulling the carrier. You can, you know, take your diff cover off, put a lunchbox locker in and go. So um, that's different. These have to be taken out, bearings. It, it takes an experienced guy to put one of these in. And uh, typically that means you're paying. So um, anyways, that's, that's the locker explanation. Hopefully, is there any questions on the lockers? Um, yeah, Mike Stewart, Detroit locker for the front and electric locker for the back, yep. question mark. Okay, so that's, that's a great question, and I will tell you 
that combination is John Curry of Curry Enterprises that makes you know all these cool differentials. That is his choice. He prefers a Detroit up front and a selectable in the back. Um, and again, you know, he's also running a, a front axle with locking hubs. Okay, so that that needs to be noted is if you're going to run a Detroit in the front, you have to have locking hubs or unlocking hubs, right? So because when you get on the street, remember, it only takes a quarter turn of that drive shaft and that thing's going to hook up and try and steer you all over. So a, a Detroit can only be run on the front with locking hubs. Next question. That's good. That's, That's it, it right now. Wow. Yeah, we're cut up. Okay, we're, guys, we are at the end. Um, I, I think I do still have a couple more slides, but... We're at the end of our time. I'll, I'll, I'll uh, give a couple more minutes for some last minute questions. And I'm gonna flip to the next slide here because I wanted to talk about steering. So the next thing that, um, and Alex, I don't know if you can zoom in on this. This is super important. Um, this, by the way, other than uh, a couple other things on your Jeep, is the weakest link on your Jeep. Uh, this steering, I'm not kidding. If you get under there, this right here is the size of your pinky. Um, so, you know, the reason I'm mentioning this is because you even touch this on a rock and it's going to be bent or worse, broken. So um, you really need to think about upgrading your steering. Of course, we, we do a whole correction kit, high steer. Um, you know, um, this is the right way to do it is what we're showing you. Um, and the, the gentleman that asked a question earlier about going to high steer, you know, we sell a knuckle that allows you to do this kind of an arrangement that'll go on your stock axle, and then that allows you to, to move everything up. The trick is you got to match the track bar mount with that new high steer point. So um, it, it requires a little bit of uh, DIY, doing it yourself. My guys can help you with that on the phone, but um, a great way to go and uh, get a lot of that stuff moved up. Yeah, the other thing I should no have you notice, there's no brackets that hang down under our axle. Look at your axle, everything's hanging down. And I recommend putting little skid plates on these because those teeny little brackets just fold over and eventually rip off. So um, those are all things that if you haven't been under your Jeep, you need to be very mindful of as you're smacking into stuff out there on the trail. We have a couple of questions sure. to finish off the show. Byron Roberts, would 37s be too much for LJR six speed with 4.10 gears? Couldn't see numbers on the chart. Uh, no, as a matter of fact, um, our sales guy, Andrew Harris, ran that for a long time. And you can see his LJ with 37s over in our gallery again. Guys, I cannot impress upon you enough. If you haven't done it, Go to our website, it's on the top blue bar, hit the gallery, and whatever kind of a vehicle, it's broken up by TJ, YJ, CJ, JK, JL, JT. Uh, look at all of those Jeeps within there. There's a massive education going on in there. We, we didn't include any Jeeps that are piles of crap. These are all nicely built the way they should be. And uh, a lot of those Jeeps have hyperlinks on them. And um, again, the moment you're there, Pick up that phone, call my guys, and uh, you can have a legitimate conversation uh, with a, a, the same information and more that I'm talking to you about right now. Jeff Benson, what would be the advantages and disadvantages between electric and air lockers? Okay, that's a great question, and it's been a popular one lately. Um, if you think about this, okay, the electric locker only takes 12 volts, so um, you literally with one flick of a switch, you know, just think about a simple switch from the battery to the differential. You put a switch in between, turns it on, turns it off. That's it, okay? With an air locker, you've got to now have power to go to a compressor, pumps up the compressor. That goes through a series of solenoids, uh, by the way, which is controlled by an electrical diagram with switches that will not allow you to turn on the front without the rear. Okay, and there's times when you do want to do that. So you can bypass that and monkey around and find some, you know, hot wire trick on the internet. But my point is, it's a lot more simple because you don't have to run all the airlines and deal with the compressor um, and deal with all of those things. By the way, that compressor 
pulls, you know, it's got a 40 amp fuse on it. So that's pulling some serious power. Um, now you may say, well, you know, I need a compressor to air up my tires anyways. Okay, but that's a significantly different compressor. You know, the, you, can, you can use the tiniest little ARB to operate the lockers. And then, uh, you know, you got to get the double ARB if you want to air up tires. So um, all things, just keep all that in mind. Um, the ARBs are fine. You know, both the, the uh, electric and the air lockers are um, reliable. You know, they, they've, they've gotten those to be really good. And a big part of it is you not overstressing the locker and how you operate the locker. You know, if you're turning it on in advance when everything's not under stress, we talked about this in one of the, the earlier tech talks, you know, you, you've got to think ahead. I'm going to need my lockers here. Turn them on. You know, once, once you're stuck is not the time to turn on the lockers. That's when you just destroy stuff. So um, all of this is, um, I, I know if you're new, really good information and uh, hard to practice. You know, you're, you're keeping an eye on rocks and the kids in the back and, you know, other Jeeps around you and the guy that's waving you and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, the last thing you think about is turn on your lockers. So um, just good information to think about. We have a couple more questions, okay, but yeah. we're... We can take a couple go, minutes, sure. sure. Okay. Uh, Chris Colwell, 2018 Jeep JKU with Genride Elite suspension, Curry 60 front and 70 rear. Awesome. Would you put mast, 6.8 liter, LS3, 550 horsepower, or 6.4 Hemi? Oh, <laughs> yeah, I, I would go uh, LS all day long, um, especially in the JK. If it was JL, the, the JL, um, there's a much more seamless uh, way to put in the Hemi through um, Dakota Customs, who is used to doing those conversions. In the JK, I do LS all day long. Yep, much easier. Great question. What else you got? Um, lots of people wishing us happy Thanksgiving. Nice. nice. Um, I'll see if I have any more slides. George Bood, oh, what breaks. about locking hub kit for stock 44? Um, a, a long time ago, Warren used to make one. I don't know if they still do. Um, I would take a look at their website or just do a quick Google search um, to see who, or if anybody offers one. Um, it does make the vehicle a little wider, you know, when, when, because they've got some extra stuff to put in there. So just be aware of that if it's already tied on your trailer or uh, somewhere that you have to try and fit, um, it will make it a little bit wider. Um, brakes was the next thing I was gonna talk about. You know, you're going to bigger tires, so I don't want you to forget there, there are some simple uh, brake upgrades, not, this is like the full on race, you know, R1, but R1 makes some upgraded rotors. They start at $99 for the pair and upgraded pads. All this stuff's on our website. Um, that you can put on and get better performance right out of the, the bat uh, with, without spending a whole lot of money um, that'll help you with those bigger tires. So don't forget about the brakes. Um, <coughs> oh, and oh man, this was like the most important thing. Okay, if you're still with me, this is what, <laughs> what I want you to think about. So this is the cost breakdown, not including labor, for you to outfit your Jeep like the red JK Vigor I have on our website. And by the way, this would apply to a JL as well, okay? Um, so this shows you, and I, I put actual part numbers in here um, with an actual description and actual prices. So the lift, 199, shocks, 574. Um, tires, 1350, wheels, 600. By the way, these are the proper backspace wheel that you need. Uh, fenders. Uh, bumpers and rockers. This whole thing comes out to 8123. This is, if you, if you do it this way, you don't have to mess with the steering, the drive shafts, or the brake lines. Okay, this vehicle will drive as good or better than stock. Okay, and uh, you will get more ground clearance by doing it this way, and it'll look fantastic. Again, go to the gallery and check out the red JK. Now, your next choice is this, and wait until you see how much more expensive this is. So here, we've, we've put in the 2.5-inch rock crawler kit. So this is the, 
the lowest one I can get you. This isn't even a three inch, okay? 2350 bucks. We've gone with King shocks, the same, same shocks, but these are now for a two to four inch lift and about the same price. 35 inch tires, 1350, wheels 600. Now we got to upgrade the steering. So we're going to go to a heavy duty chrome Ollie steering from Rock Jock, 579. We're going to do the same fenders, bumpers, all that stuff. Down here at $1,500, brand new drive shafts from JE Reel. So the factory has a CV style drive shaft and those cannot run for a long time on a lifted Jeep. They'll, they'll literally burn up. And I've seen Jeeps burn down because of it. So you have to change those drive shafts. If somebody tells you different, tell them you want an insurance rider from them because they're lying to you. They don't know what they're talking about and get out of their shop. Next thing is, we talked about skid plates for the belly and then lockers and gears. We're already at 12,353 and that doesn't include lockers and gears. Okay, so I want you guys to really come to grips with the, the choices and the decisions you're making and where you're spending the money. Um, and, and again, this does not include any labor, guys. Um, so either you're super handy yourself or you're gonna talk to some shop and try and get a deal. Um, and remember, you get what you pay for. So if the installation's free, I don't know how far I'd go from home. So <laughs> keep that in mind. More questions? Uh, Pamela Spear, any disadvantage to removing my air tank and running the ARB double straight? Uh, no, you'll just hear the pump cycle more often. So every time you hit the lockers, the, the pump's gonna cycle. Right now it's taking the air as a reserve from the tank, and, um, but, but it's that simple. And by the way, some of the ARBs have a little tiny tank on them that's exactly enough to run the front and rear locker. So it's, it's like the size of this water bottle. It's just a little bit smaller. So, yep. I think that's about it. You might wanna start with this chart uh, again next week. Well, next week. For those who have gone. Yeah, so next week we're gonna talk about going from 35s to 37s. Now that's not the next show. The next show is gonna be on Thanksgiving and we're gonna be coming to you from my house <laughs> again, like the old days. Um, I'll have the Terramoto there. We're gonna talk about a bunch of stuff that I just did on the Terramoto in preparation for us going out to the Hammers. And um, I, I haven't really done much on the Jeep since I raced it at KOH. And I've been driving it all over the place and drag racing it and doing all kinds of things. So it was time for me to uh, look after it a little bit. And I'm, I'm pleasantly surprised I didn't find a lot of stuff. So I'll give you that full report on Thursday. So if we're lucky enough to have you join us on Thanksgiving, we will talk to you then. Otherwise, the next show after that, which would be the next Tuesday, we'll be talking about 35s to 37s and, and what, what advantages and disadvantages you have. Well, even though we talked about a lot of that today, um, we'll cover that again in more detail. All right, guys and gals, thanks for joining us, and we will see you next time.